Book 4 The Book of Partings Eagerly, spurred by Ares swift in their souls to the war cry, all now press to their homes for the food of their strength in the battle. Ilion turned her thoughts in a proud expectancy seaward, waiting to hear the sounds that she loved and the cry of the melee. Now to their citadel, Priam's sons returned with their father. Now from the gates, Talthibius issued, grey in his chariot. But in the halls of Anchises, Aeneas, not doffing his breastpiece, hastily ate of the corn of his country, cakes of the millet doubled with wild deer's flesh from the quiet hands of Creusa. She, as he ate, with her calm eyes watching him, smiled on her husband. Ever thou hastest to battle, O warrior, ever thou fightest far in the front of the ranks, and thou seekest out Locrian Ajax, turnest thy ear to the roar for the dangerous shout of Tydides. There, once heard, leaving all, thou drivest, O Stark, in thy courage. Yet am I blessed among women who tremble not, left in thy mansion. Quiet, at old Anchises' feet, when I see thee in vision, soul with the shafts hissing round thee, and say to my quivering spirit, Now he is striking at Ajax, now he has met Diomedes. Such are the mighty twain, who are ever near to protect thee, Phoebus, the thunderous son, and thy mother, Gold Aphrodite. Such are the fates that demand thee, O destined head of the future. But, though my thoughts for their own are not troubled, always, Aeneas, sore is my heart with pity for other alien women who in this battle are losing their children and well-loved husbands, brothers too, dear, for the eyes that are wet, for the hearts that are silent. Will not this war then end, that thunders forever round Troia? But to Creusa the hero answered, the son of Anchises, Surely the gods protect, yet is death too always mighty. Most in his shadowy envy he strikes at the brave and the lovely, grudging works to abridge their days and to widow the sunlight. Most disappointed, he rages against the beloved of heaven, Striking their lives through their hearts, he mows down their loves and their pleasures. Truly thou sayest, thou needst not to fear for my life in the battle. Ever for thine I fear, lest he find thee out in his anger. Missing my head in the fight, when he comes here crossed in his godhead. Yet shall Phoebus protect and my mother, gold Aphrodite. But to Aeneas answered the tranquil lips of Creusa, So may it be that I go before thee, seeing Aeneas over my dying eyes, thy lips bend down for the parting. Blissfullest end is this for a woman, here mid earth's sorrows. Afterwards, there we hope that the hands shall join which were parted. 
So she spoke, not knowing the gods. But Aeneas departing clasped his father's knees, the ancient mighty Anchises. Bless me, my father, I go to the battle. Strong with thy blessing, even today may I hurl down Ajax, slay Diomedes, and on the morrow gaze on the empty beaches of Troas. Troubled and joyless, not replying to warlike Aeneas, long Anchises sat, unmoving, silent, somber, gazing into his soul with eyes that were closed to the sunlight. Prosper, Aeneas, slowly he answered him. Son of a goddess, prosper, Aeneas. And if for Troy some doom is preparing, suffer always the will of the gods with a piety constant. Only they will what necessity fashions, compelled by the silence. Labor and war she has given to man as the law of his transience. Fight. She shall give thee the crown of thy deeds or their ending appointed, whether glorious thou pass or in silent shadows forgotten. But what thy mother commands, perform ever. Loading thy vessels, who can know what the gods have hid with the mist of our hopings? Then, from the house of his fathers, Aeneas, rapidly striding, came to the city, echoing now with the wheels of the chariots, clanging with arms and a stream with a warlike tramp of her thousands. Fast through the press he strode, and men turning knew Aeneas, greatened in heart, and went on with loftier thoughts towards battle. He, through the noise and the crowd, to Antenor's high-built mansion striding came, and he turned to its courts, and the bronze of its threshold trod, which had suffered the feet of so many princes departed. But as he crossed its brazen square, from the hall there came running, leaping up, light to his feet, and laughing with sudden pleasure, Eurus, the youngest son of Polydamus. Clasping the fatal war-hardened hand with a palm that was smooth as a maiden's or infant's. Well art thou come, Aeneas, he said, and good fortune has sent thee. Now I shall go to the field. Thou wilt speak with my grandsire Antenor, and he shall hear thee, though chid by his heart reluctant. Rejoicing, I shall go forth in thy car, a warring by Penthesilia famous, give to her grasp the spear that shall spite down Achilles. Smiling, answered Aeneas, Surely will, Eurus, thy prowess carry thee far to the front. Thou shalt fight with Epeus and slay him. Who shall say that this hand was not chosen to pierce Menelaus? But for a while, with a bull should it rather strive, O hero, till in the play and the wrestle its softness is trained for the smiting. Eagerly, Eurus answered, But they have told me, Aeneas, this is the last of our fights, for today will Penthesilia meet Achilles in battle and slay him, ending the Argives. Then shall I never have mixed in this war that is famous forever. What shall I say when my hairs are white like the aged Antenors? Men will ask, And what were thy deeds in the warfare Titanic? Whom didst thou slay of the Argives? Son of Polydamus, venging bravely thy father? Then must I say, I lurked in the city, 
I was too young, and only ascending the Ilian ramparts saw the return or the flight, but never the deed and the triumph. Friend, if you take me not forth, I shall die of grief ere the sunset. Plucking the hand of Aeneas, he drew him into the mansion vast, and over the floor of the spacious hall they hastened laughing, the gracious child and the mighty hero and statesman, flower of a present stock and the burdened star of the future. Meanwhile, girt by his sons and the sons of his sons, in his chamber cried to the remnants left of his blood, the aged Antenor. Hearken, you who are sprung from my loins, and children their offspring. None shall again go forth to the fight who is kin to Antenor. Weighed with my curse he shall go, and the spear points a thirst of the Argives. Meet him, Roth. He shall die in his sin, and his name be forgotten. Oft have I sent forth my blood to be spilled in vain in the battle, fighting for Troy and her greatness earned by my toil and my father's. Now all the debt has been paid. She rejects us, driven by the immortals. Much do we owe to the mother who bore us, much to our country. But at the last, our life is ours, and the gods and the futures. Gather the gold of my house, and our kin, O ye sons of Antenor, warned by a voice in my soul, I will go forth tonight from this city, fleeing the doom and bearing my treasures. The ships shall receive them gathered, new-keeled by my care and the gods, in the narrow Propontis. Over God's waters guided, treading the rage of Poseidon, bellying out with their sails, let them cleave to the untraveled distance, ocean's crests, and resign to their fates the doomed and the evil. So Antenor spoke, and his children heard him in silence, awed by his voice and the dread of his curse, they obeyed, though in sorrow. Halimus only replied to his father, Dire are the white hairs reverend, loved of a father, dreadful his curse to his children. Yet in my heart there is one who cries, Tis the voice of my country. She for whose sake I would be in Tartarus tortured forever. Pardon me then, if thou wilt. If the gods can, then let them pardon. For I will sleep in the dust of Troy, embracing her ashes. There, where Polydamus sleeps and the many comrades I cherished. So let me go to the darkness remembered or wholly forgotten. Yet, having fought for my country, true in my fall to my nation. Then, in his aged wrath, to Halimus answered Antenor, Go then, and perish, doomed with the doomed and the hated of heaven, nor shall the gods forgive thee, dying, nor shall thy father. Out from the chamber Halimus strode, with grief in his bosom, wrestling with wrath, and he went to his doom, nor looked back at his dear ones, crossing the hall, the son of Antenor and the son of Anchises met in the parts of their fates, where they knotted and crossed for the parting. One, with a curse of the gods, and his sire, fast wending to Hades, fortunate, blessed the other. Yet equal their minds were, and virtues, 
Cyprus' son to the Antenorid. Thee I have sought and thy brothers, bow of Antenor. Sore is our need today of thy counsels. Endless our want of their arms that are strong, and their hearts that recoil not, meeting myriads stark with the spear in unequal battle. Halamus answered him, I will go forth to the palace of Priam. There, where Troy yet lives, and far from the halls of my fathers. There will I speak, not here, for my kin they repose in the mansion, sitting unarmed in their halls, while their brothers fall in the battle. Eurus eagerly answered the hero, Me rather, therefore, take to the fight with you. I will make war on the Greeks for my uncles. One for all I will fill their place in the shock with the foeman. But from his chamber door, Antenna heard and rebuked him. Scamp of my heart, thou torment, into thy chamber, and rest there, bound with cords, lest thou seize, thou flutter brain, scourged into quiet. So shall thy lust of the fight be healed, and our mansion grow tranquil. Chid by the old man, Eurus slunk from the hall, discontented. Yet, with a dubious smile, like a moonbeam lighting his beauty. But to Antenor, the Dardanid born from the white Aphrodite. Late the Antenorids learned to flinch from the spears of the Argives. Even this boy of their blood has Polydemus heart and his valor, nor should a life that was honored and noble be stained in its ending. Nay then, the mood of a child would shame a grey-headed wisdom if for the fault of the people virtue and Troy were forgotten. For though the people hear us not, yet are we bound to our nation. Over the people the gods are. Over a man is his country. This is the deity first adored by the hearts of the noble. For by our nation's will we are ruled in the home and the battle, and for our nation's will we offer our lives and our children's, not by their own wills led, nor their passions, men rise to their manhood, selfishly seeking their good, but the gods and the states and the fathers. Roth and Tenor replied to the warlike son of Anchises. Great is the soul in thee housed, and stern is thy will, O Aeneas. Onward it moves undismayed to its goal, though a city be ruined. They too guide thee, who deepest see of the ageless immortals, one with her heart and one in his spirit. Cyprus and Phoebus. Yet might a man, not knowing this, think as he watched thee in airs, spurring Priam's race to its fall, he endangers this city, hoping to build a throne out of ruins soul in the Troad. <laughs> I too have gods who warn me and lead, Athene and Hera. Not as the ways of other mortals are theirs who are guided, they whose eyes are the gods, and they walk by a light that is secret. Coldly, Aeneas made answer, stirred into wrath by the taunting. High wert thou always, nurtured in wisdom, ancient Antenor. Walk then, favoured and led, yet watch, lest passion and evil feign Augusta names and mimic the gate of the deathless. And with a smile on his lips, but wrath in his bosom, answered, wisest of men, but with wisdom of mortals, aged and tenor. Led or misled, we are mortals. 
and walk by a light that is given. Most they are who deem themselves most from error excluded. Nor shall thou hear in this battle the shout of the men of my lineage holding the Greeks as once and driving back fate from their country. His alone will be heard for a space while the stern gods are patient, even now who went forth a victim self-offered to Hades, last whom their wills have plucked from the fated house of Antenor. They now, with wrath in their bosoms, sundered forever and parted. Forth from the halls of Antenor, Aeneas rapidly striding past once more through the city, hurrying now with its car wheels, filled with a mightier rumour of war and the march of its thousands, till, at Troy's upward curve, he found the Antenorid crestward mounting the steep incline that climbed to the palace of Priam, white in her proud and armed citadel. Silent, ascending hardly their feet had attempted the hill, when, behind them, they hearkened, sweet-tongued, a call and the patter and hurry of light-running sandals. Turning, they beheld with a flush on his cheeks and a light on his lashes, challenging mutely and pleading the boyish beauty of Eurus. Racer to mischief, said Halimus, couldst thou not sit in thy chamber? Surely cords and the rod await thee, Eurus, returning. Answered with laughter the child, I have broken through ranks of the fighters, dived under chariot wheels to arrive here, and I return not. I too for counsel of battle have come to the palace of Priam. Burdened with thought, they mounted slowly the road of their fathers, breasting the Ilian hill where Laomedon's mansion was seated. They, from the crest down gazing, saw their country's housetops under their feet and heard the murmur of Troia below them. But, in the palace of Priam, coming and going of house thralls filled all the corridors. Smoke from the kitchen skirled in its plenty, rich with savour, and breathed from the labouring lungs of Hephaestus. Far in the halls and the chambers, voices travelled and clustered, anklets jangling ran and sang back from doorway to doorway, mocking with music of speed and its laughters, the haste of the happy. Sound came of arms. There was tread of the great. There were murmurs of women, voices glad of the doomed in Laomedon's marvellous mansion. Six were the halls of its splendour. A hundred and one were its chambers, 